Well, I have to say, yeah. that after, after that intro, um, I, I was going to say anyway, I have the very, very uh, great honor of being sat up here with Juan Atkins, who I'm the techno editor at Mixmag, and I wouldn't have that job title if it wasn't for this man. So, um, yeah, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's, it's, yeah, it's a pretty big deal, man. Um, before I go backwards, I wanted to start with something quite recent, which is um, the other day you picked up the Spirit of Detroit Achievement Awards. Oh, wow. And yeah, you know about that. Yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And um, it's, it's handed to, to, to people from Detroit who have made an outstanding contribution. Um, how did it feel when you, uh, when you picked up the awards? And huh. You know, the, uh, the thing that I can think about was the, that building is the city uh, city council building, is where the uh, Detroit City Council resides, and where you do like uh, you get your marriage license, and uh, you can change your name there, and it's like the municipal city uh, office. And uh, when I started uh, uh, Deep Space Records, which is the first label that that I released Cybertron on, I had to go to that building. And, and uh, get my certificate to open my bank account and register with the city. And I, I never thought, dreamed, I mean, I was like 17 years old and they're filling out this form that 30 years later, <laughs> I'd be collecting an award in that same building. So that was all I could think about while I was up there uh, making a speech. <laughs> and it was, um, it was you, Derek, Me, Jeff Mills, Derek, Carl Craig, yeah, basically yeah. all of the the, yeah. the, fr the techno fraternity that yeah. picked up the, the yeah. awards. W was everybody there? Or was no, it, no, no, no. Of course, Derek and Jeff weren't there, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, you know they still got honored anyway. But you know. And what what <laughs> what was the, the the actual evening itself like? Because I've seen pictures of you guys with your your awards and stuff, like having like doing a photo call and stuff like that. Did you did you celebrate in any way? Was it kind of like a uh, or was it quite a sort of formal situation? Well, that whole week was kind of like a blur because <laughs> <laughs> because movement was coming that weekend, and you know we I, I had a show with Borderland prepared preparing for it, then we had an after party preparing for it. So all of this stuff was like kind of like segueing into each other. So uh, I actually can't remember what happened after that. <laughs> but uh, and how was movement this year? Uh, I was it was great. It was great. We um, it, it's good every year, but. Uh, uh, it was really good. Uh, uh, we did the Borderland show on the main stage. Craftwork played there for the first time, Great. and uh, we were on the stage before them. Uh, was good and bad in a way because, <laughs> <laughs> well, they didn't let us. They didn't let anybody do visuals before them. Right. Okay. So, uh, and uh, I didn't know. I, I wouldn't have signed on for that. But uh, the negotiation was done through Lawrence, which is. Uh, uh, Mort's nephew, so uh, I, unbeknown to me, mm. I was uh, spending the day campaigning for visuals that uh, ultimately I got shut shut down. That's a shame. Yeah. That's a shame. But it's funny again, like you came full circle there by like being on the same stage as Craftwork, and they were one of the people yeah. that inspired you in the beginning. Yeah, yeah, definitely it was it was a plus for that at least. Can you tell us, uh, I'm not sure if everyone here is familiar with Borderline. It's the project you have with Moritz von Oswald. It's a project Oswald. that I've done uh, with Moritz von Oswald, and, uh, who uh, is from Berlin, and uh, he was uh, the uh, architect behind the basic channel and chain reaction labels and all of that uh, minimal Berlin uh, from the start. You know, so uh, we've been working together. I, I've done my, my Deep Space album in his studio uh, he engineered, and uh, so that was kind of the beginning of our collaboration. And how how long have you been working together now, then? Uh, well, you know, we've been working on and off for what was that like '95, when I when I was there doing that doing that record with them. But um, we even did the Three MB project a couple of years prior to that. Actually, the first time I went to Berlin uh, was to work with them in the studio, work oh. in their studio with uh, Thomas Feldman and Mark Ernestus. And how did you guys get in touch with each other? Oh, they 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 came to Detroit uh, in the early days. They were uh, Mark, uh, Thomas, and Moritz uh, came to Detroit, and uh, me and Mike Banks was living in this building on Twenty Thirty Grand River, and they come to this building and and met us and and you know wanted to meet us. And I got a knock on my door one morning. And <laughs> Mike, uh, it was Mike knocking, and I opened the door, and it was him and these three German guys, 
And uh, so they said, yeah, man, they wanted to meet you and everything. So I met them and uh, they were there like buying uh, old uh, gear from all of the pawn shops. Like, uh, you know, because people had to, at, at that time didn't know the value of a, of a synthesizer of an mm -hmm. ARP X or, you know, those kind of early synths. So, you know, I guess they would, you know, people needed money and they would go to the pawn shop. So these guys come and buy up all of, the, all of this gear and uh, take, took them back to uh, Berlin and retrofit it with MIDI. So you could MIDI, because this was before MIDI even was implemented. Mm -hmm. And uh, so they had a way to, to retrofit these machines with MIDI. So one of, part of my interest to go to the studio was to be able to, to make use of, of their, uh, I guess, invention of MIDI with all of these different manufacturers. Because it was like really horrible in the early days because uh, none of the manufacturers would, would talk to the other right. company like you couldn't you yeah, couldn't yeah. you couldn't sync a a core keyboard with a rolling drum machine you know until midi came along and uh, so but before midi they figured out a way to retrofit these machines with midi uh interfaces so it allowed us to like if you if you had a, a rolling drum and you had a Korg or, or dx7 you know you could talk to each other. I guess in, in yeah. a way like the, that kind of DIY thinking about the future like yeah. p p making sim speak to each other yeah. is kind of what techno is about in a way is like yeah. you know like creating a language whereby technology can can communicate with each other and, and you can communicate as a human being with other yeah. humans through technology. Yeah. Yeah, I mean it was real tedious in those days, man. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Did you um, did you spend a lot of time then trying to kind of get your head around that kind of stuff? I mean, you know, I mean, I mean, the passion was there, so I mean, I wasn't going to be denied. <laughs> but uh, but uh, it's needless to say, it was. Uh, I mean, you know, you, you, I mean, you can't you can't imagine how many tracks that would have seen the light of day had I, had they been able to be finished. Mm. And uh, uh, it was a lot of stuff that. By the time I got the patch cables and got everything to work, I forgot the idea. <laughs> and <laughs> and uh, so, you know, a lot of that, a lot of that stuff was like really f f from scratch on the fly. You know? Crazy. Once, man. The, once the stuff got working, then you could finish your, you know, or you basically had to start a new, whole new idea. So, you know? what were the kind of key challenges that you faced then in the, in those kind of like pre MIDI days? Well, I mean, one of the one of the main things was if you wanted to record, you know, this was the time before um, before you were able to um, um, record your tracks in the digital domain. Uh, so you had to record to tape, and and um, one of the main challenges was was getting your your sequence or your drum machine to sync to the tape, and. Uh, and uh, man, you, I, I mean, we spent hours sometimes. I mean, sometimes we had to kill a whole recording session because we couldn't get the boxes to sync yeah. to the tape. And uh, I can remember coming to England doing a lot of remixes in the early days, man, and like half of the session was just getting the machine to sync to the tape. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so that, that was one of the main issues. Then once you got that going, then you have to figure out, you know, uh, you was always troubleshooting. You know, because sometimes you would plug something up and it's supposed to work, but you don't hear hear nothing. So you have to trace back the whole, you know, schematic to see where, you know, why you're not getting sound. And sometimes it'd be just a faulty patch cable, you know, and it's a nightmare, man. <laughs> <laughs> and um, one of the things that really interests me as, as, a, as a journalist, journalist and as a person is, um, is the origins and the beginnings and, and where people come from and people's stories and yeah. how things begin. And, you know, like one, one thing about the, the, when a genre kind of starts to become a genre of its own is like that transition from it being like maybe an, an amalgamation of different things and a hybrid of different things and then yeah. all of a sudden Techno's here, you know, like, uh -huh. at what stage did you kind of feel like the music that you were making was a kind of defined genre? Was, was there a point where you're like, this, this is definitely like so different to everything else before? Well, I, I knew that 
when I first started. Yeah. Um, 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 I mean, I had, I had, you know, a lot of it was experimentation and just, uh, you know, it's like a, it's like a, a coming up with a, I don't know if, you know, when, I, when, when people, when you were young, you know, you would go in the kitchen and mix up a, a whole bunch of different sauces and things and come up with these different concoctions that, you know, that no one would dream of, like you mix, mix ketchup and mustard and hot sauce to make some kind of different sauce or, you know, it's the same thing. It was the same. We're doing the same thing with instruments, though, with gear. A much more complicated yeah, process, though. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And tell me, um, I want to kind of get an idea of, I've, I've never been to Detroit and I, I really, really want to go and like obviously being the techno ed editor at Mixmag, like maybe that's right. a, a faux pas on my part, maybe I should, I should definitely have been there, but what I want to get a grasp on is not necessarily what Detroit is like now, but what it was like when you were first starting to pre produce music, like what was the neighborhood like where you grew up and what was Detroit just well, on the wider I mean, scale like? If, uh, uh, if Detroit is the uh, is the uh, the auto industry city. I mean, it's the world headquarters for you know General Motors, Ford, GM, and I mean, and uh, Chrysler. And um, so it's very industrial. And and at at the height of the industrial age, Detroit was a very big booming place. Mm -hmm. But of course, when technology came and the automation came, uh, the robots replaced workers. And, it, and the city kind of became depressed. People started moving out. So it was very, very post-industrial. And uh, this was right during the time at the decline of that, like right at the very bottom almost. And uh, uh, a lot of the, the sentiment of the city was, was trying to regroup behind the collapse of the industrial age. And uh, which, you know, uh, since the auto industry was embracing technology, the whole city embraced technology. Oh. I mean, and it, 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 it spread to the arts, to the music, and you know, so the whole idea was was to escape this uh, this uh, sort of depressed period uh, with uh, optimism of of why it was depressed, you know, and uh, which is the transformation into a technological society. So uh, it was just a part of that whole process with the music, you know, it was just a natural thing. And what, what was it like where you grew up? Was, was it heavily affected by this depressed? Well, the whole city yeah. was, yeah, the whole, the whole city was like, you know, it was, it was, I mean, hey, you know, we just filed bankruptcy a couple of years ago, right? Mm. So, uh, uh, but, but that to me created a, a more, more passion to, to be creative, you know, and I don't, I don't think that this, Thing, this movement would have started in any other city. It was a perfect ground, perfect right, fertile ground for, for new technology and ideas, and, and you know, not just you know in, in the industry, but you know, in the arts and the music as well. Some of the some of the music that inspired you early on was kind of like Kraftwerk, Depeche Mode, Tangerine Dream, people like that. Yeah. Was 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 it quite common for? young black kids in Detroit to be listening to that kind of music or was it unusual? Uh, it was, it was common and it was unusual. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, uh, you know, I, I don't know, it's something about, uh, about that sound, uh, 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 that craft work, you know, like when I heard We Are The Robots and, and uh, you know, it just matched what was going on in the city at the mm. time. Yeah, the automation. And, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Yeah, and, and how just, how did that music filter into your world? Uh, there was a DJ on the radio. See, this was at the time when FM was really young and just started. So uh, uh, when FM uh, came into existence, uh, the, the, there was only three stations on the FM dial, and, uh, and it was very loosely formatted. And nobody was paying attention. And uh, so there was this, this DJ that came on called Electrifying Mojo, and and he uh, had no format restriction, uh, you know, because, uh, you know what I mean, they would, you know, these FM stations would like play a whole side of an album, you know, with no interruptions, no commercial interruptions. <laughs> and uh, so, you know, they were able to do what, what they wanted to do and, and that lended to people being very creative in their programming. And uh, so this was one of the DJs that, that played, you know, um, 
everything across the spectrum. You know, I mean, this is here's a guy that would play a Peter Frampton record behind uh, George Clinton, you know, and uh, uh, so uh, it was just a crazy mix, but it worked. And, he, and Electrify, Electrify Mojo became a, a very important figure yeah. during that era, didn't it? Yeah, yeah. So that's where I actually first heard the Kraftwerk record was, was on his show. And, uh, and uh, I, it just uh, froze me in my tracks because, you know, I was doing music, but, but, and I was doing totally electronic. But this was the first time where I heard it, like, really uh, precise and, mm -hmm. and together and, you know. And I was like, yeah, that's, that's organized. You know, <laughs> my music was all over the place, but it was, it was still, it was very organic and electronic. All the, everything was electronic, but, uh, you know, I didn't know basically how to work with se sequencer and things mm. like that at, that at that time. My early demos, everything was played by hand. So even the drum tracks, even the, the, the drum kit were, was made out of sounds, white noise from, the, from that machine. <laughs> yeah. And how did you get hold of that machine in the first place? My grandma bought me uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, this machine. I think it was uh, either it was for my birthday or Christmas or something. Uh, <laughs> my grandma had a, a Hammond B3 organ, and I used to mess around with this organ. I think I was in like grade school, like second grade, man. I must have been like seven or eight years old. And I would come home and I would bang on this organ and, you know, and uh, so she, she would, I would go with her to uh, a shop called Grinnell's is where they, where they sold all, all the organs and pianos and, and uh, uh, Grinnell's eventually had this back room where when the, these, these new keyboards started coming out, they would have them showcased in this back room. So when she was in the front buying sheet music and getting her organ repaired, I'd be in the little room messing around with this Quark MS-10 or the mini mode that were just being introduced for consumer use. And uh, so uh, eventually one day we were in there and she was in there doing some business and I think it was the holiday, it was either my birthday or Christmas was coming up, so I said, brung her in the room, I said, Grandma, I really want this machine. <laughs> and she got it for me. <laughs> and, uh, you know, the rest is kind of history. Yeah, thank, thank yeah. you, Grandma. <laughs> <laughs> yes, God rest her soul now. She's yeah. passed, but, yeah. That's She's amazing. just looking down, so thanks, Grandma. Yeah, man. Yeah. And um, how long was it before you started acquiring other piece of pieces of kit? Did you spend a lot of time with the MS-10 and then decided that you wanted other bits? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, the second piece of gear I got actually was a, a Profit. What was it? It was a... Pro One, what they called it. It was, it was actually a mini version of the Prophet. And both of these machines were mono, mono, uh, poly, monophonic, so you couldn't play chords, mm. and they were not memory capable either, so every time you switched the machine off and switched it back on, it was basically a new sound. And uh, if you didn't record your settings, you know, it, it, you know, it was hard to get that same sound back. And uh, so that, that was another part of the tedious process, <laughs> yeah. And what, um, in, in those initial stages when you had those first two pieces of kit, what, what, were you kind of, what sound were you aiming to create? Were you trying to replicate stuff that was already in existence? Were you just kind no, of like... No, definitely. The whole beauty of the, of the synthesizer was, when, what I loved about it is because you can make sounds that didn't exist before so that was my whole thing with it i was like hey you know why why you know have a synthesizer just to produce something that's already there you know and uh, so that was that was a large part of of the drive to, to create this sound yeah. and when did you actually eventually finish a track did it take you quite a while? No, 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 no. I mean, as soon as I got the synthesizer, man, my first track was done that day. So, <laughs> <laughs> you know, so uh, I mean, but only I, I'm the only one that was able to listen to it outside, <laughs> outside grandma and, and, and people that kept telling me to turn that, sh turn that shit down. <laughs> <laughs> but... Uh, yeah, but eventually they, they came around after, you know, when Mojo played the first record, then they, they couldn't say nothing else. Nice, man. How did, yeah. you, how did you manage to get your music to Mojo? Uh, that's another story, long story, actually. Well, not really so much long. Um, um, Derek May actually was my best friend in high school, and 
And uh, he, he moved to Detroit uh, from Belleville uh, before, before I did. And uh, of course, Mojo was like our idol. And uh, so I, I guess uh, Derek was uh, called himself like my PR guy. <laughs> and uh, so he, he the, Mojo used to go to this cafe called Burt's Place uh, down the street from the radio station, like when he got, he, his slot was every night from 10 to 3, every weekday, 10 to 3 a.m. And so after, um, after he got off, he would sometimes go to this, uh, this cafe to have a coffee and kind of wind down. And uh, so Derek actually camped out at the, at the cafe because they had this video game called uh, Defender. And, uh, yeah, which he became an a, a <laughs> expert at, you know. And uh, so he, he would steal his mom's car at night and drive down and camp out at this cafe waiting for Mojo to present my music to him. And uh, one day, of course, he, I mean, he, after he like camped out there for like, for like a couple of months, he, he came in and he met him and he gave Mojo, I had a, this was a cassette tape demo and uh, he gave Mojo the demo, and uh, a couple of days later, Mojo uh, sent left a message with the cafe owner. That he he wanted to talk to us. He, he liked the music and wanted to talk to us. And uh, so we had a meeting with him, and he said, "Yeah, man, if if you if you ever get this out, I would I would definitely play it." So hey, man, we ran to the pressing plant <laughs> like literally out of his office. And uh, got a record pressed up on 45. This was when 45s were still. Anybody knows what a 45 RPM vinyl? Okay. <laughs> and uh, it's a, it, so we had this record released on a 45 RPM, and we took it down there to him. And uh, it's a crazy story is when we came with the record. Um, uh, wait a minute. No, I think this was the first meeting when we had the can't remember. It's, it's kind of it's like thirty something years ago. So, um, but uh, I think we had a white label, and so we took it, and and no, 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 it was a cassette still, and uh, so Mojo took us in his office, and this was at a time where he would go through these different musical tangents. Like th at this point, he was on a reggae tangent, uh, and uh, so he was in his office, and he had this record record reggae record playing. And uh, then he put our record on at the same time. This other record was playing. We put the tape on because then he had the, the, the record playing, and he put the tape on. And he's got both of these tracks playing at the same time. And he said that if I take the record, the reggae record off, that means I like your record. And so he let it. He did this, and we're watching him. And like five <laughs> minutes goes past. <laughs> And he eventually takes the reggae record off, and he's like, "Yeah." <laughs> and uh, so, yeah, we um, we so when we got the actual label copies done, we gave it to him, and sure enough, two two nights after that, he played it, and uh, it was uh, it was funny, probably one of the best moments of my life. Yeah, actually, man. sounds yeah. like a really big moment. Yeah. And yeah. what what track was it that he was playing? Alleys of Your Mind. Cool. It was uh, the first Cybertron. Yeah, yeah. Uh, we called ourselves Cybertron and released this record on Deep Space Records, mm. which was the label that I was down at the city council building. Yeah, yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah. And then. Um, um, what was I going to say? Uh, so, that, so that was that was a really big moment, and it came through Electrify Mojo, who was a he was he became hugely hugely popular, and I think it was you that told a story at ADE last year about him. He would like he had he had so much power over his listeners that he would be like right when I play this track everyone go out and like turn the light on yeah, and off man. on your porch and like the whole street would be like lights yeah, going on man. off and off. <laughs> oh yeah, he 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 had a he had a a, a segment of his show that uh, he called the Midnight Funk Association, and every every night at midnight he would have the whole city like if you're in your bathtub splash the water if you. <laughs> If if you uh, turn on your porch light, or if you're in your car, honk your horn and flash your lights, man. And I mean, every night at midnight, man, the whole city would light up, you know. And uh, I mean, and, and like his, the station was situated on uh, East Jefferson, which is like one of the major cities that runs parallel to the river. 
And uh, there was a park at the end of the, the street called Belle Isle Park. And, and so people would be going to the park and they listened to Mojo Man and you couldn't get through the street when he did the Midnight Funk Association, man, and the street would literally jam, especially in the summertime. And, uh, it, you know, he created traffic jams in front of the station, man. It was amazing. Did yeah. you, um, did you, what's, I'm sorry, what's he doing now? Do you, do you, do you know if he's I around? still talk to him. Yeah. He's, he's, uh, uh, he's still, you know, he's, he, walk, he wears a suit now and suit and tie, and he's like a, like a businessman and, uh, uh, I think he's doing like real estate and stuff like that now. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I try to talk him back into to radio. I mean, we're doing an internet station called deepspaceradio.com. Mm -hmm. And I actually tried to get him to, to do a, a cameo on our station. I mean, he, he didn't say no, but he didn't say yes. <laughs> <laughs> you have to keep plugging away. Yeah, yeah. Does he realize how important? Oh, yes, he yes, yes. He, he, um, uh, he's 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 uh, shown up to a couple of events that uh, that I played at um, in Detroit, uh, a couple of major uh, events, um, you know. So he he definitely is aware. How did you go about setting up the label, um, um, Metroplex? Well, uh, when I graduated from high school, uh, this was I hadn't I had a record out yet, but I had these demos that I was you know, making with this machine. And uh, so my first year in college, I met Rick Davis, who was the other half of Cybertron. Well, you know, at, we, it had, we hadn't started Cybertron at the time, but uh, so I met him and he uh, had already had a record out that he had pressed himself. And at, at this time, I didn't, nobody was aware that you could literally press up your own record. You thought you had to go to a major record company and get a deal. And uh, nobody realized that you could actually, you know, make your own record and sell your own record. But this guy had already had a record out, although it was totally uh, atmospheric, electronic music. I mean, there was no beats or nothing on it. But at any rate, he had this record that he had already pressed. So that, that gave me the, uh, the, the, the initial idea to, you know, uh, to do this, to create our own label. Well, he, it was his idea, basically, but we created Deep Space Records and did our Alleys of Your Mind. It was like one of the first tracks we did together, and, uh, and we put it out. How did you manage to fund it? <laughs> Beg, borrow, and steal. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, no, actually, you know, it didn't cost, I mean, we only pressed up like maybe 100, like I think we pressed up 500 copies, mm -hmm. which cost about $500. And, um, and, you know, I mean, you know, we chipped in. I mean, it, you know. And whereabouts were you distribu distributing them? Uh, uh, just in Detroit. I mean, it was a, what you call a local record. Mm. I mean, nobody outside of Detroit heard this record uh, until we eventually got picked up by Fantasy Records. Then they took us national. But that wasn't until our second record, which was Cosmic Cars. So basically, it was just a local Detroit. Although it was a smash in Detroit, mm. uh, it didn't... It, you know, it was just in Detroit. It kind of, it kind of filtered out to like other cities, kind of in a, in the Midwest. Like uh, Cleveland was the closest next city to Detroit, like a three-hour drive. So they, there was a DJ that was from Detroit that went to a Cleveland Star program in a Cleveland station. So he was aware of the record and he took it. And so it played a little bit in Cleveland, a little bit in Chicago, but that was about it. How did the music start filtering into the clubs? And what kind of music were people kind of generally playing and listening to in, in clubs before techno started to kind of like in, infiltrate and permeate? Well, you know, the club, the club scene was, was, was kind of uh, on the heels of disco. The disco era kind of started the whole club scene. And uh, a lot of the disco DJs were playing only disco versions, which were 12 inch record singles that were on an album format, basically. And, uh, uh, but this record was on a 45. Mm. And it was funny because DJs wanted to play this record so bad, they would actually take the record and glue it to a 12 inch. <laughs> 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 to be able to play it in, uh, in the club. So, uh, uh, 
so that's kind of like how it kind of filtered into the club. <laughs> <laughs> why why do you think the why do you think the record resonated with people to that degree that they would do that? What, what, what do you it think was it just was it was a new it was just a new sound. It was it was funky. It was you know different, um, and it was just you know people tend to gravitate towards new things, you know, and uh, and it was it was a hot record, man. It was, you know, damn right. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I wanted to speak a little bit about the scene and the importance of the scene, the, the TV show, the scene. Like, um, I don't know if anyone here knows what the scene is, but the scene was like, it was a TV show. It was kind of like, um, you know, like Soul Train, where you have like a row of people, but yeah. it was like people dancing around. And I've seen footage from that. I've seen yeah. like Shari Vari and I've seen <laughs> like uh, No UFOs and stuff. And yeah. it's like, it looks so incredible. And like, yeah. if you compare it to like a techno club now where Generally, people kind of like in dark clothing. Yeah. It's a dark environment, and it's it, the beat can be quite monotonous, and people aren't really that flamboyant. But when you watch clips of the scene, it's like people like going for it, and like everyone's got their own groove and their own yeah. dance. Like, yeah. can you tell me a little bit about the scene? Um, you know, it was a local show, locally produced show. Um, uh, the host Nat Morris and R.J. Watkins, uh, they just, you know, uh, they were they started out at WGPR, which is the radio station where Mojo was. So, you know, they were kind of like looking at Mojo and he, you know, a lot of the good the records that he would play, they would pick them up and just put them on the show. And uh, it was kind of an extension of, of, of what Mojo was doing, but just on a, on a, on a TV dance show. And, uh, and so, yeah, they, were, they went for it. Can, can you remember when, um, when one of your tracks was played on there for the first time? Do you have any um, I mean, we we watched the show. Um, I, you know, I, it didn't have the same effect on me as it as when Mojo played it. You know, um, um, uh, although it was good to hear, it was, uh, but I can't remember the first time I heard it on there. Can you recall yeah. what the, the the general kind of like fashion was when people were going out to clubs? How would they dress in general? You know, without being too like, oh, specific. Oh man, uh, I think this was the time. This was this was post disco. So, I mean, it was like a lot of, I mean, it was still like um, Swedish knit pants, uh, uh, polyester shirts with the big collar, you know. Uh, yeah, it was, you know, still, it's that 70s kind of mm. disco still, you know, even though it was like 80, 81, you know, it was still kind of a lag over from disco era. And when, when was there, when did you feel like there was a, a kind of a scene building around techno, you know, when other people started to sort of like replicate the sound and it became like the dominant sound in Detroit and in the clubs? Well, um, what happened was after, uh, I mean, especially my, my closest friends, Derek, Kevin, Eddie, you know, after they seen all of the accolades that I was getting from this record, you know, I mean, it was like, because I mean, I was basically a celebrity in Detroit. So I'd be with these, I'd be with them and like, you know, we'd be hanging out and like, I had all the girls, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> <And> <laughs> so they wanted to have the girls too. So they said, hey man, I gotta make a record, you know? <laughs> so, <laughs> so that's basically how the kind of like, uh, the group kind of like just came about, you know? <laughs> that's brilliant. Um, can you tell me a little bit about what the uh, what the, the ethos was behind Metroplex? Was there like a general kind of like this this is Metroplex, this is what it stands for? Um, um, a part of a part of my whole process, and uh, uh, I guess uh, what I didn't talk about was a, a lot of uh, the development is owed to uh, when I was in high school uh, at Belleville High School, they had a class there called Future Studies. And uh, I took this course because, of course, I was interested in the future and sci-fi, all things sci-fi in the future. And uh, so I took this course, and they had uh, the manual for this course. Uh, the reference book was uh, Future Shot by Alvin Toffler. And uh, in this book, he, he, he talks about uh, the transition from an industrial society to a technological society and, and how that's going to affect, uh, you know, uh, the, uh, the world as we know it and, you know, uh, social life and, you know, and uh, so there's a lot of things that he talked about and, and actually one of the, the things that he talked about is uh, how the cities would grow so large that they would grow into each other and become a, a metro complex or a metroplex. 
and uh, so that's kind of like where we got to work these different words and new terms and you know to describe things that didn't exist at the time you know that of course you would have to come up with different langu language and different mm. words and terms to describe these new these new developments and uh, so we, we kind of you know kind of like just went with the with that and re got right in, right into right into it and it started to develop our own words to you know for things that we foresaw coming and uh, so with just metroplex is just a short short version of metro complex mm -hmm. which you know you have the dallas fort worth metroplex yeah. and uh and so that's that's where that came from and how about the the, the word techno techno is, well, of course is short for technology mm -hmm. so you know just it was just simple you know just um, you know hey this is Techno technology music, but technology music doesn't really have a good <laughs> ring to it, so we shortened it to techno. Yeah. How do you feel about the the way that techno has evolved and spread around the globe, and is now actually, according to recent statistics, is the most purchased genre on Beatport? It's quite wow. a, quite an impressive stat, considering the amount of crap EDM out there. Oh man, cool. <laughs> <laughs> Beatport owe me some money then, right? <laughs> <laughs> Anybody here from Deepport? No. Uh, uh, no, that's it's amazing. I didn't, I didn't. I, I mean, I heard that recently, you know, from somewhere else, and uh, it, it, you know, that's that's definitely amazing. I, I, you know, I would have never dreamed that, you know. I mean, you know, I I kind of knew that uh, we were were, I guess you could say, pushing the cart forward but I never knew that it would go off the rails. Yeah. And, and that's basically what's happened. <laughs> yeah, man, yeah. you're right. Well, I'm going to stop asking questions and say, anyone out there got a question for Juan? This gentleman over here. Yeah. Hi, Juan, how's it going? Hi. Um, I'm just wondering, um, you didn't touch on, were there any kind of influence because t House and Tacknum kind of grew up around the same time. Were you listening to any of the primitive house music that would have been developing around the same time as you were kind of starting to create your own ah, kind of genre okay. of music? Now I got to tell the story about house music in Detroit, right? <laughs> um, <laughs> oh, okay, where do I start here? Um, me, we had, we had a, a situation which later on when we do the film and the book and everything, you know, I gotta re pull something. I can't tell everything right now, but <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, I'll shorten the story to say that um, we, uh, we were, and a part of this movement started because we were able to acquire like these 909s when they first came out and, uh, and the TR-808s, that's another story I'll tell later. But uh, at any rate, uh, we would play. We would take these 909 drum machines and play uh, at parties and use them to play at parties. Which Jeff Mills still—that's where he's famous at right now. And uh, so that's where that came from. And uh, so one day it was, uh, you know, everybody had these 909s in Detroit and stuff that we were getting. You know, that's another story. But uh, Derek <laughs> had to pay his rent and. He didn't have money to pay the rent, so he had to sell his 909. And I said, well, Derek, you can't sell it to anybody in Detroit, especially Jeff Mills, was who was in the market for that. <laughs> uh, because they'll use it against us. <laughs> so, <laughs> so he had the idea to take it to Chicago and sell it to Frankie Knuckles. And Frankie Knuckles took that 909, him along with him and Chip E, and made uh, that first house record with that 909. And uh, ultimately, it did come back to haunt us because we then became in competition with Chicago. But it was friendly competition. But at least they weren't in our own backyard. And uh, so uh, that's kind of how the, the movements kind of paralleled each other. It's friendly comp comp competition because uh, you had uh, Fraudy Jack Master Funk that they had the Hot Mix 5 
on the radio, whereas in Detroit, we didn't really, you know, after the kind of disco era kind of faded, our mixers went off the air. But they continued in Chicago. And uh, so uh, when, like, No UFOs came out, man, Farty Jack Master Funk, man, played the hell out of that record. And uh, we were selling more records in Chicago, actually, than, than they were selling themselves, and, and, and even in Detroit. So uh, that's kind of how that story went. What a great story. <laughs> <laughs> First of all, I love that Chicago and Detroit were fighting each other to make house and techno. It's amazing. Um, you know, sometimes as a musician and an artist, you feel a little bit crazy and you have to get these sounds and these musics out of your head. Uh -huh. um, and then you feel kind of like you're fighting the world. Like, was there a time when you felt like giving up? And if so, like, how did you kind of get nah, through man, it? No, man, never give up. Never give up. And that's, I know the question is coming at what do I, advice that I want to give to young and up, up, up aspiring producers, never give up and never be scared to take risks. <laughs> that's it, what more do you need? <laughs> Probably got time for two very quick questions. Hi, Juan. Hi. How big an influence was P-Funk and like uh, George Clinton on your sign? What, yeah, what, what's, what is it? Question. Funkadelic, how, yeah. how big an influence was that oh, on man, your side? Oh, major, major, um, because that was the music I kind of uh, grew up with. I mean, P-Funk and George Clinton, to me, was like, uh, I guess, electronic or dance music is to the generation now. Um, uh, you know, it was, it was uh, something that, it, something about the music that, you know, that definitely, um, and I mean, uh, that was the first time that you heard, like, really funky dance music. 75% electronic, you know, and, uh, with Bernie Worrell playing like in the bass region with these, these new synthesizers that were coming. And, uh, and, and you can hear a large influence from that in my music even to today. So uh, it was definitely strong, like records like Flashlight and Knee Deep and, and uh, yeah, man, One Nation Under Groove is one of my all time favorite records. Yeah. yeah. Uh, hello. Uh, hi. Uh, at some point, people would have started coming to uh, as record buyers to Detroit. Like, I have a friend who uh, helps run a record store called Rub It Up in a distribution place, and he used to tell me about him and uh, Martin Mackay's first trip to Detroit and how they kind of met Mike Banks and Wilbur. And, huh? Yeah, Wilbur. That's okay. him. Yeah, uh, Wilbur Sanderson. Um, right. And uh, I wondered about how these encounters generally went and how you and you know whether you gave preferential treatment to, to to somebody that would come over just based on how i guess they would approach you and how much knowledge they had coming about the music coming to detroit where obviously it was you know probably quite a different sort of environment from where they were coming from hmm? preferential treatment i don't wait a minute i guess like you know people would have uh i'll give you i'll give you an example of what i'm alluding to um wilbur <laughs> mentioned that when he spoke to Mike at UR, he, uh, they were all, like, Mike was almost rooting for him because for coming from Glasgow, they were against, a, they were coming up against a lot of competition from London. Uh -huh. And that resulted in almost like uh, this underdog mentality that Wilbur started to, uh -huh. to, to have. And, and it was something that Mike at least understood and tried to support him in that way. So I wondered if those encounters, uh, how those encounters generally went and whether uh, the uh, and whether they always went well or whether you know these were some th sometimes went wrong. I don't know. I wasn't really involved so much in that. You know, I kind of was always kind of to myself, and you know, I, I was very secretive about things. So I really, you know, people kind of felt like I was unapproachable, which I probably was. <laughs> so you know, I didn't, I didn't really, uh, I didn't really get too involved in that political area. Does that answer the question? Maybe. <laughs> okay. Do one more. We can very quickly do one more question. Hi, I saw you before. <laughs> but, um, so you know, like obviously you're from Detroit, and like obviously techno started there and everything. Do you feel like with the economy crisis in Detroit, that techno music could change that for the city, like you know, and the crime rates and everything, like? 
do you think if they put out more music classes that it could help, you know, the youth and all that and the econ economy? <laughs> yeah, yeah, definitely. I, 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 I totally agree with that. As a matter of fact, we're about to launch a DJ and electronic music production school called Spin Inc. in Detroit. And, uh, and, and uh, we've been talking to the city and different um, uh, educational uh, people, board of, uh, board of Education, to, you know, to implement our program and like, you know, for, uh, focus towards uh, inner city youth and uh, uh, people that go to prison and coming out of prison. And, you know, so yes, I definitely think that uh, if there's more opportunities and, and uh, avenues provided that, uh, you know, it, it would uh, kind of uh, decrease a lot of uh, the negative uh, aspects of the city, for sure. Although I don't want to end this, because I think we're having a really great chat and it's <laughs> been absolutely Thanks. wonderfully informative. Um, we're going to close there, but it's a good, it's a good way to close because we're speaking about techno facilitating a brighter future for Detroit and techno is all about the future. So yeah. I think that was a good, good place to end. For sure. Juan, thank you very much. Thanks thank everybody you. for thank being you. here as well. And thank you very much to Marcus as well. Thank you, Marcus.